Hello everyone, today's story is on Frederick Trish. The case of Frederick Trish highlights the devastating consequences of a life consumed by criminal activities. His involvement in a series of armed robberies and murders led to his conviction and eventual execution. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Frederick Trish was born on November 1st, 1968 in Ohio. He grew up in a middle-class family in Bluffton, Ohio. Frederick struggled in school and lacked a positive male influence growing up because his parents divorced and his father chose not to stay in the picture. He attended Bluffton High School, but because of his academic struggles, school was of no importance to him and he began skipping class on a regular basis. He had picked up a vandalizing property habit when he was in junior high that followed him into high school. He also began stealing, but he was able to get away with it. By age 17, Frederick was concerned not only with his criminal ways, but also with females. He ended up fathering a child at 17. This was a turning point in his life because he obtained his first honest paying job. Frederick started working as a heavy equipment operator and for a while, he was doing a good job. Unfortunately, one day while working on the job, he suffered from a concussion. After the concussion, Frederick became severely depressed and that is when he started dabbling in drugs. Eventually, he became addicted to cocaine. With no job and addicted to drugs, Frederick turned back to a life of crime. In the 80s, he was convicted of burglary and theft. Over the years, his offenses escalated and he became involved in more serious crimes. Frederick ended up meeting a fellow user and criminal by the name of Benjamin Brooks. Benjamin, who was born on October 15, 1972 in Ohio, had a decent upbringing, but he had an extensive criminal record for nonviolent offenses such as theft and drug possession. Their paths crossed in April of 1994 when they agreed to commit crimes with each other and use together. Over the course of three weeks, Frederick and Benjamin went on a drug-fueled, multi-state crime spree. He robbed banks and businesses, he sexually assaulted people, and stole cars. At the end of his three-week crime spree, he decided to up things a notch. On August 25, 1994, Frederick and Benjamin drove to Michigan and walked into an adult video store called Best Video Store. The owners were brothers Frank and Gasson Dano. Frank had just returned from Grand Rapids, Michigan after discussing expansion of the video store business in that city. They had already opened two stores, one in Livonia and one in Wyandotte. There was money coming in and the brothers were happy and successful. Frank was a single man and Gasson had been married for three years. Gasson was working that night at one location and asked his brother Frank to come up to the store to talk and spend time together. Frank agreed and he made his way to the store. They talked for hours. At one point when they were talking in the office, they heard the sound of a door shut inside the adult section of the videos. Suddenly, Frederick had appeared in the doorway of the office, blocking Gasson and Frank from leaving. Gasson asked, Who the hell are you? Frederick pulled out his gun and pointed it back and forth from Frank to Gasson. He then asked them what time it was, but before they got a chance to respond, Frederick said, It's 10 o'clock, brother time to get killed. Gasson told Frederick that he would give him money and asked not to be shot. He moved toward a drawer where the money was located, but Frederick shot him in cold blood. Frank reacted and started struggling with Frederick. The clip fell out of the gun and Frank struggled to grab it. There was a second voice. It was Frederick's accomplice, Benjamin. Benjamin told Frank to freeze and the struggle stopped. Next thing you know, Frederick fixes his gun and shot Gasson and Frank again. Frank was shot three times and Gasson was shot five times. Benjamin and Frederick robbed the store and fled. When paramedics arrived at the adult video store, they saw Frank, who was in critical condition, and Gasson was pronounced dead. Frank had an 18-inch metal rod implanted in his leg and a bullet that had to remain lodged in his body. Benjamin and Frederick temporarily got away with this crime and drove to Cleveland, Ohio. On August 27, 1994, Frederick and two companions, Keisha and Benjamin, left Cleveland, Ohio to smoke crack in an Eshtabula hotel room. After using, the trio returned to Cleveland to purchase more drugs. While back in Cleveland, they picked up a fourth member to their group, Anthony Washington. All four of them were driving and smoking crack at the same time. After a couple of hours, 
the group decided to rob a business so they could purchase more crack. Anthony encouraged the group to rob Vine Street News. The Vine Street News was another adult store in East Lake, Lake County. Frederick and Benjamin were armed with a 9mm handgun and a sawed-off shotgun. According to court documents, the handgun was loaded to the maximum capacity with hydroshock bullets that were designed for penetration and maximum stopping power. Right before entering Vine Street News, Keisha handed Frederick a roll of duct tape that would be used to gather and restrain any witnesses or victims. Frederick and Benjamin then entered Vine Street News at about 11.30 at night. They pretended to be interested in magazines and started browsing. The two men eventually made it to the sales counter where Vine Street News employee Louis Lava was standing. Frederick pulled out his 9mm, pointed it at Louis, and ordered him not to move or call out for help. Frederick then asked Louis where the security guard was, and Louis motioned toward the back of the store. Frederick walked through the swinging doors into a restricted area at the back of the store and placed the handgun in his pants. Louis followed directions and remained in the same spot Frederick told him to stay, even though Frederick was now out of sight. Minutes later, Louis heard four gunshots coming from the back of the store. From Frederick's perspective, he said that after passing through the swinging doors into the back of the store, he saw two customers behind a rack looking at magazines and he also saw the store security guard, Henry Dupree, sitting in a chair watching television. Henry Dupree was an off-duty police officer working as a security guard for extra money. Initially, the two patrons, nor the security guard, noticed Frederick. Frederick quietly took out his gun, poked Henry on the shoulder with it, and ordered him to stand up. Henry, startled, followed Frederick's commands. Frederick's plans were to take Henry to the front of the store, but he noticed handcuffs in Henry's pants and decided to use them on him. Frederick then attempted to put the cuffs on Henry, but a struggle began. Henry chose to fight and do his best to save himself. Unfortunately, Frederick won the struggle and Henry was shot. While all of this was happening, Benjamin remained in the front of the store and he had ordered Lewis to empty the cash register. After emptying the cash register, Lewis remained motionless with his hands in the air. After shooting Henry, Frederick returned to the front of the store. Before exiting the store, Frederick decided to aim the gun at Lewis. He fired two times, striking him in the jaw and forearm. Frederick claimed that he did not want Lewis to call 911, so his intentions were to shoot the phone that was on the wall behind Lewis. After Benjamin and Frederick left the store, Lewis lost consciousness but woke up shortly after and mustered up enough strength to call 911. Henry, who had been in the back of the store the whole time, finally made his way through the swinging doors and struggled to get behind the counter where Lewis was. He was too weak though and ended up collapsing. When police and paramedics arrived at the scene, they pronounced Henry dead. Lewis thankfully survived the ordeal. Authorities then spoke with a man by the name of Paul Former. Paul witnessed Frederick and Benjamin walk into Vine Street News while he was across the street at a drive up pay telephone. He heard popping sounds, and then saw Frederick and Benjamin leave the scene. Paul ran to the store and noticed Lewis on the phone, but realized he was shot in the face and was having a difficult time speaking. Paul took the phone to speak with the dispatcher and he gave a description of the two men and their vehicle. Dale Plunkard, who was a store customer that hid in a viewing booth throughout the whole ordeal, claimed that he had heard three or four shots. He claimed that after the shots, he emerged from the booth and found Henry unconscious. Like Paul, Dale was also able to see Frederick and Benjamin flee the scene in their vehicle, so he too gave police a description of the car they drove off in. Before authorities were able to catch up with them, they continued committing crimes. They forced another innocent victim, Dennis Langer, into their car and drove him to Pennsylvania, robbing different locations on the way. Frederick and his posse ended up letting Dennis Langer free. Sergeant Ronald Stey, out of the Euclid Police Department received a dispatch about an armed robbery. He was on Interstate 90 and spotted a vehicle that matched the description given by Dale and Paul. Sergeant Ronald followed the men off the interstate and another officer, Officer Frederick Stolt, also began following the men in his own separate vehicle. Frederick and Benjamin, with Anthony Washington as their getaway driver, were going over 60 through residential streets. At one point during the chase, Frederick began shooting at cops from the back window. Benjamin and Frederick then took turns shooting through the opening from the roof of their car. Even though shots were being fired at them, authorities refused to withdraw from their pursuit. As time passed, Anthony ended up losing control of the getaway vehicle. He crashed. 
Sergeant Ronald said that Anthony immediately got out of the car and assumed an action stance and pointed his handgun at him. Frederick then got out of the vehicle and fired his firearm at Sergeant Robert and Sergeant Frederick. Backup was requested, but before backup could arrive, Frederick fled the scene with Keisha. Benjamin stayed behind, and when more officers arrived at the scene, he was put in cuffs. With a description of Keisha and Frederick, officers Michael Janisak and Harold Prettel began searching for them on foot. Both officers approached a garage where Officer Harold saw Frederick aiming a gun at him. Frederick was ordered to drop the weapon, and he complied. Frederick threw the gun down, but he did not surrender. He ran away and attempted to jump a fence. Officers were able to prevent him from hopping the fence, and he was apprehended. Frederick was then transported to the Euclid Police Department, and then he was ordered to be transferred to the Eastlake Police Department. Before arriving at the Eastlake Police Department, Frederick heard on the police radio that Henry Dupree, the man he shot at the adult store, had died. Frederick arrived at the police station at 2 a.m. and interviews began. He claimed that he had no idea he shot Henry and did not intend to kill him. He gave the same excuse for shooting Lewis. Lieutenant Thomas Doyle conducted several interviews with Frederick and he claimed that Frederick was high and paranoid. Benjamin and Frederick were shown a written statement from surviving victim Lewis and after that, both Benjamin and Frederick refused to speak with investigators any further without legal representations present. When trial began, evidence was stacked against Frederick and Benjamin. There was surveillance footage at the crime scene where Henry was killed, and there were witnesses that identified him as the killer. Frederick pleaded guilty to one count of aggravated murder with two aggravating circumstances, two counts of attempted aggravated murder, one count of felonious assault, and one count of aggravated robbery. Defense argued that Frederick had a troubled past and suffered from mental illnesses that influenced his actions. Prosecution portrayed Frederick as a cold-blooded killer who showed no remorse for his actions. A Lake County grand jury found Frederick guilty on all counts, and during the penalty phase, the jury recommended he be sentenced to death. The trial court agreed with the jury's recommendation, and he was sentenced to death. As for Benjamin Brooks, he pleaded guilty to lesser charges in connection with the crimes committed because he took a plea deal. He was found guilty, but because of his cooperation, he was sentenced to 70 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Frederick was never charged with murdering Gassan Dano in Michigan because he was sentenced to death in Ohio. Over the years, there were appeals. Judge O'Neill concluded that Frederick never received proper Miranda warnings and that absent the inferences drawn from Frederick's improperly obtained statements, the state could not prove the lack of mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt. After another review, Frederick's death sentence was affirmed. Governor John Kasich denied Frederick's last plea for a clemency. He learned that Frederick's victim Henry was sitting when he was shot, not standing like Frederick claimed. Frederick's execution date was set for March 6, 2013. For his last meal, he had steak, eggs, hash browns, cottage cheese, onion rings, and a hot fudge sundae. When it was time for his execution day at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, Frederick wanted to be remembered as an example of how drugs can ruin your life. Frederick had three witnesses supporting him. Defense attorney James Benza, anti-death penalty advocate Bill Kimberlin, and spiritual advisor James Reed. For his final words, Frederick said, This is where drugs will lead you. This is true life. He thanked Wish TV reporter Karen Hensley of Indianapolis for an Emmy award-winning documentary she did on him after the crime. He said that he wished reporters would have been allowed to film his execution. He then thanked the execution team for their professionalism, James Benza, and fellow death row inmate James Goff for his friendship. He denied killing anyone besides Henry Dupree, even though two family members of his victim, Gassan Dano, were there in attendance. Frederick continued, I'm not here to say I'm sorry to any of these victims that are here. I've never been tried, never been charged with that crime. I'm here for Henry Dupree. I apologize to his family for what I've done. You want closure? Closure only comes with the book. You close it and put it on the shelf. There is no closure. Every holiday, every birthday, everything, you will think about the victim. So if you want me murdered, just say it. None of Henry Dupree's family members were able to attend the execution to hear those words. His surviving family was either too ill or too sick to make it. 
the Dupree family actually gave up three of their witnesses for the Dano family. 32 minutes after his lethal injection started, Frederick was finally pronounced dead. Witnesses said he remained stoic the whole time. After Frederick died, Deanne Dano, Gasson's sister-in-law, said that justice was served because there was one less criminal in the world. She was also appalled that Frederick refused to admit killing Gasson in an incident that also injured his brother, a surviving victim who identified him. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below.